Hi everyone, I'm going to talk about a newly recognized mechanism for generating high-grade flake graphite mineralization at Graphite Creek, Alaska. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the USGS, University of Alaska Fairbanks, Geosep Services, and Laurentian University, as well as Graphite One for providing access to the site. Flake graphite has been designated a critical mineral by the U.S. in large part because of its use as anode material and lithium ion batteries needed for electric vehicles, energy storage systems, portable and portable electronics. It will be a crucial commodity for the transition to net zero carbon emissions. The U.S. remains completely import reliant on graphite, mainly from China, and will be a significant consumer. Graphite criticality is also important to countries like Australia and Canada that will consume less, but could be potential producers. Being an industrial commodity, graphite is classified as either amorphous, lump and chip, or flake based on size and crystallinity. These types generally form in different mineral systems, although the geologic settings of crystalline deposits, lump and chip, and flake overlap. Amorphous deposits form through local contact metamorphism of coal by intrusions. Lump and chip deposits are highly unusual. They are characterized by hydrothermal graphite veins hosted in granulite terrains and deposited from either supercrustal, metamorphic, or even mantle carbon and fluids. Some may be related to shallow magmatic or volcanic activity. Flake graphite deposits can also form in high temperature regional metamorphic terrains, either from simple graphitization of organic carbon, devolatization of marble, or potentially other processes involving hydrothermal fluids that are not well understood. Lump and chip vein deposits are generally small, whereas flake deposits are medium to large with lower grades and higher tonnages. The goal of our research was to understand which of these processes were dominant at Graphite Creek. Our study locality is in the Kigalwek Mountains on the Seward Peninsula, about 60 kilometers north of Nome. You can see the main exposure here at Graphite Creek with the drill pad in the distance in the Emmerich Basin to the northwest. The most recent NI43-101 resource estimate for Graphite Creek is about 11 million tons at 7.8% measured and indicated contained graphite, with an additional 92 million tons at about 8% inferred. This makes it by far the largest flake deposit in the United States. The deposit is unique in that some of the graphite is concentrated in sets of narrow lenses less than one meter wide that grade as much as 50 weight percent graphite. The deposit is hosted on the northernmost edge of the Kikawake Mountains gneiss dome, which is composed of neoproterozoic to potentially mesozoic metasedimentary rocks of the Kigalea group that were metamorphosed to granulite facies metamorphism and uplifted in the middle Cretaceous. Regionally, these rocks may be correlative with the Nome complex and even Brooks Range rocks. The ore body is hosted in sillimanite paranice with graphite disseminations as well as high grade lenses shown here. On the left is a massive graphite pinch swell lens and on the right, is another lens about a meter wide and at least seven meters across an outcrop with an old adit that was excavated through it. You can see right here. The general sense of shear is top of the north or right lateral. The rocks show migmatitic textures and evidence of extensive melt loss during high temperature metamorphism, such as enrichments of garnet to form almost a cumulate-like rock, as well as zones rich in sillimanite and a general loss of quartz. On the right, you can see massive graphite, including garnet porphyr blasts, and some lenses also contain tourmaline. The garnet requires silicate ground mass to grow. The absence of this strongly suggests removal of silicate material through melt loss, with graphite as a residual or rustitic phase. To learn more about the metamorphic processes, monazites were analyzed 
at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Lurichin University using wavelength dispersive spectroscopy, WDS, and laser ablation split stream methods. The trace element profiles of and WDS maps show thorium rich yttrium depleted cores and yttrium rich rims, which is consistent with biotite dehydration melting, in which biotite plus plagioclase plus silimonite plus quartz yields garnet plus K feldspar plus melt. And this took place at around 95 million years ago based on the ages of the monazite cores. With the younger event, a retrograde metamorphism around 85 MA. So the monazite chemistry confirms what we see in drill core, that is that melting took place in these rocks. We did some detrital zircon geochronology using uranium lead on the on the paranysis and got some surprising results. Um, we got really unusually young maximum depositional ages of Triassic or younger that can't that we cannot rule out, and a clear middle Cretaceous um, anatectic zircon population that you can see here is obvious through these really high uranium thorium ratios, and these ages are not recognized elsewhere in the Kigalea group or in the gnome complex. We did carbon isotope and sulfur isotope dating at the USGS G3 Science Center lab, and the carbon isotope values are remarkably consistent. They range from about minus 20 to minus 15, which are consistent with an organic source. And sulfur isotopes of minus 5 to plus 5 are consistent with sedimentary sulfur. And this indicates that the carbon was derived locally from a politic protolith and that we don't have to invoke external carbon sources to explain the graphite enrichment. In our model of graphite mineralization that we developed from, from these data sets, we start with a high total organic content carbonaceous shale that was subsequently subjected to high temperature metamorphism and partial melting. The melt and fluid were extracted and lost probably through shear zones with graphite left behind and enriched as, as a rustic phase, at the same time also generating these garnet and silimonite restites. So really here the, the key is this anatexis or partial melting which has removed silicate material thereby concentrating the graphite. So with this model of graphite enrichment that we've developed, um, we can derive the following exploration or mappable criteria that are considered important for this type of high-grade plate graphite mineralization. First, you need a carbonaceous protolith that was deposited in an anoxic setting. You also need evidence of high temperature metamorphism, for example, the silimonite plus K feldspar assemblage, which is sometimes also called the second silimonite zone, or in this case, an isograd on this map. And that indicates that you're in the upper amphibolite to granulite facies environment. And ideally, you want evidence of partial melting, such as descriptions of migmatite or even condolite, which is a somewhat more obscure term, but can also be used in these, in these settings. And if you have the zircon data, particularly detrital zircon data, and you see anatectic zircons, that's an obvious sign that the rocks have undergone partial melting. And shearing or shear zones might help facilitate melt loss of providing conduits for the melt and fluids to escape and thereby helping to concentrate graphite. And although uh, 
high temperature rocks are not yet known in the Brooks Range. Um, the rocks at Graphite Creek, which are here in the red, um, they correlate with what's in the Western Brooks Range. So if there are any high temperature rocks that are underneath the Brooks Range that have been exposed in any kind of structural panels, then those could potentially be um, permissive. However, the uh, nice domes in the Chukotka Peninsula are almost definitely uh, permissive for this type of uh, flake graphite mineralization. Thank you.